Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God, our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What causes you to drag your feet? What makes you, in other words, hesitant to do something? Maybe it's, you know, um, you're worried about the end result. I'm not sure I have the skill to complete this project, and and so I don't really want to get started into it and mess it up and and, and have it not turn out right. Maybe it's just something you you don't really like to do. But there's there's things, right? We we drag our feet on different things. If If I wait too long to mow the lawn, then it gets, you know, we get that, rain shower that's kind of rare in summer sometimes, then it jumps up, it, it gets clogged up in the mower then when it's wet and tall. Um, I, I, I thought of that, but then I thought, well, maybe a better example is clearing snow, waiting too long, and it gets kind of hard and packed and, and frozen. Um, you know, it, there, there's, there's all kinds of things. Maybe it's, it's some other kind of chore or, you know, laundry or taking out the trash, whatever it is. You know, there, there are things that, that we tend to maybe delay kind of drag our feet as we do it. Now in our verses immediately preceding our text for today, Paul has been telling the Roman Christians how the actions of one man had results for all mankind. And he underscores it twice in our lesson for tonight. Just two verses. Romans chapter 5, verses 18 to 19. It's printed there in your bulletin. And it says, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. It coincides with our stanzas from Paul Gerhardt's hymn, A Lamb Goes Uncomplaining Forth. Tonight we're going to see how that lamb goes in accord with the Father's will. Now this idea of parallel, right? The, 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 he says the one man and the one man. Now, now it's, it's unequal. It's a parallel, but it's, it's very unequal. Now you heard Pastor Laudi a couple weeks ago talk about Isaiah 53 in terms of stanza one of the hymn. And it, you know, in, the, in Isaiah 53, it's that, that unequal trade, right? What he got because of our sins and what we get because of, of his great work for our sins. But even though it's unequal, one thing they have in common, again, is that the the actions of the one man impact the entire human race. Paul brings us back to the Garden of Eden, and and you you know that story. You know how how things happen there. And, And Paul describes it as one trespass. One thing, singular, right? One It implies, the the word trespass implies a a fall to the side or a misstep. And you know, you think about that, and and what might we say if if we're doing something and and we have and we we make a mistake, we might say, oh, that's that's just a little mistake, no big deal, right? You think about it, it's why we have an eraser on a pencil. It's why we have uh, maybe white out for a pen, right? It's why we have a, a backspace key on a computer. But we also know that at times there simply is no margin for error. About, uh, what is it, about 10 years ago now, I had, I had the opportunity to serve for a year uh, helping the missionary in, in Cameroon. And, and some of you may know him from his time at Great Plains. It was um, Pastor Dan Myers was there. And um, he, he's been called home to heaven. I was discussing with his wife about a month ago. I, I saw her and we were talking about one time when we had to go to this village and you, you, you had to park the truck and then walk the last few miles kind of down this path. And the, the locals were leading us down the path. And all of a sudden we got to this point and there's, there's kind of this, I don't know what the right word for it is, not, not ravine, not maybe that big, you know, but it, it's this deep ditch and, and it's deep. And there's uh, kind of a creek or something at the bottom 
And how do you get across? There's, there's basically a log across that ditch, that, that deep ditch to, to get across. And, and it's a big one. It's, I mean, these are trees that, that uh, you know, there's one of them that they would haul like on a semi-truck as they're, they're hauling it, you know, into town and things like that. But it's been raining, right? So it's slippery. And if you're not a big fan of heights, it makes it even worse. And you look and you realize that no matter how careful you are, one misstep could be very bad. Certainly it would cause injury, maybe even worse. There simply was no margin for error. And we we recognize there are times that's true. And here's what Paul reminds the people. One trespass. One trespass means condemnation. And God's judgment shapes the history of mankind. His declaration would be guilty. It's the death sentence. And it is exactly what we deserve. The punishment fits the crime. We can trace it all back to that one trespass in the Garden of Eden. Now, it's not the only one. We know better than that. In our lives, we we pile more and more on top, but it's the root cause, and and we make sure to keep doing that, right? We make make sure to keep piling more and more of those sins on top. There's one hymn that we, we have in our hymnal. It says, From depths of woe, I cry to you. We recognize what we deserve. But then there's that parallel. From the trespass, there is condemnation. From the righteous act, justification. And so by definition, that that way it's said here is an action that meets expectations as to what is right. It's basically being morally acceptable. And so again, Paul makes mention, he uses the singular one, right? One righteous act. But of course we know it was more than that. It's it's the life and the death and the resurrection of our Savior. So, So his one work, that life, that death, that resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul sums up basically, um, for lack of a better word, he sums up Jesus' entire career in this one term. That one act, but it fits, right? It fits. We, we heard in the Passion History reading tonight about that Jesus said we, we have to do, it has to be done this way to fulfill what was said. And when Jesus went to the Jordan River to be baptized, John says to him, no, 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 no. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus responds, let it be so now because it is proper for us to fulfill all righteousness. Our Savior's entire life was the fulfillment without every single part of it. If you took one thing away, it wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't be all sufficient. And so in taking on human flesh, his life, his ministry, that was that one righteous saving act. And he says this one righteous act resulted in justification for all people. And so from condemnation to justification, from a guilty verdict with no possibility of any sort of leniency to vindication to acquittal. That's pretty remarkable. And again, just as the trespass of one man meant death for all, this indicates that the result of that, that one righteous act brings uh, that, that, that announcement of acquittal. And so just as condemnation has a legal status, we said the the judgment was guilty now through Jesus Christ and this one righteous act. He says not guilty. Where there's justification, there's also life for all people as well. Of course, that's the, the extreme opposite of death. Spiritual death is removed because um, the, the separation between God and man has been removed by the, by the work of Jesus Christ. And so Christ's righteous act, his entire work in ministry, is all sufficient. And it's only lost for those who reject it. Who reject it in unbelief. 
who try to go their own way. And so, so we've seen one misstep, right? And we've seen the correct action. One results in condemnation, the other results in, in life-giving acquittal, and both affect all people. It's really quite simple, and yet it's extremely profound. And we see the need, don't we? Verse 19 parallels what verse 18 said. Here's the misstep, the trespass. This time it's, it's spoken in terms of obedience. And he says, Through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. For some, that would be incredibly offensive, right? If, if, if you told them they were a sinner. For others, they, they kind of wear it as a badge of honor, kind of a way to show, yeah, I don't, I don't listen to authority. But the status is very real for all of us. We are those who have fallen short of what God demands, fallen short of the perfection that He requires. Think back again to the Garden of Eden. What was, what was, the, kinda, what was going on in, in Adam and Eve's head? Well, we see it a little bit. They, they want to be equal with God, really. They want to know, the, know what good and evil is, right? Then we will be like God. We might look at that and think, boy, that was foolish. Who would possibly think that way, right? But then we realize each and every time that we think we know better. Each and every time we've looked and, and known exactly what God says, exactly what God um, requires and demands in his law, and done something different, really we are deciding we're, if not equal, maybe even a little bit above. It's for those times of, of, of direct uh, violation, direct, going directly against what he says, but also, also those times in life when, when we look and we wonder and we know that God says he's always with us. We know God said he's always working for our good, and yet we go, how can this possibly be when things get really bad? How could this possibly be for my good? This can't be. And again, we think we know a little bit better. We see, we see that disobedience in our lives as well. We thank God that the, the disobedience is countered also, right? That, that parallel. Through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. We're going to see it in, in stanza two of our hymn that we're going to sing here in just a few minutes. Who is the Lamb that's our focus? We know it is, it is Christ. We hear the voice of the Father, not directly quoted from Scripture, so you can't say it's from this book in chapter and verse, but it is very scriptural in what it says. In John's Gospel, the Savior describes his saving work. He says, doing exactly what the Father has instructed me. And as our hymn verse states, it's, it's all laid out there, exactly as it would be. This is God himself who came to suffer our guilt and condemnation. Who came to suffer the wrath and the stripes so we might bear the fruit of his salvation. And then you look at verse 3, and it's, it's, it's remarkable in how very simple and straightforward the Son's response is. And again, um, you know, I mentioned earlier about, about dragging our feet when we don't want to do something. And yet there's really nothing at all that can compare to what our Savior came to do. And again, the words in our, in our hymn are not direct quotations, uh, chapter and verse, but they are very scriptural. The scene is, well, could very well be the Garden of Gethsemane, right? That we heard tonight when the, when the Savior goes and he says, Father, if there is any other way, take this cup from me. But, but if, if, if there's not, not my will, but, but your will be done. For us sinners who are condemned by the one trespass and so many more, our Savior came to fulfill the promise that was made in the Garden of Eden. And he came to be the righteous act that would free us from condemnation. 
The closing lines of stanza three express the feelings of mankind quite well. We see the one who came in accord with the Father's will, who didn't drag his feet when he came knowing exactly what he was going to have to suffer. And we know who he is, and we cry out, we look, and we say, what have you done? Right? We look, and, and in terms of how we would think, we'd say, the Father's doing what? What is he asking the Son to do? And then we, then we stop again and we look and we go, and he's doing it? The Son is actually doing that for those who turn their back in rebellion against him. Then we stop and we look and we say, this is love. This is the only love that could save It says he, um, in in the hymn verse, it says he finds his bed within the grave. This is God who created all things and, and, and he's allowing his life to be taken. This is love. This is perfect and willing love. And so again, we look back at verse 19. Through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. And it's a, the future will be made. It's, it's continuing. It doesn't end. You think, you think back to Moses in the Old Testament. And when he went up Mount Sinai and he gets those tablets of the law from God, he comes down and his face is glowing with God's glory because he's had that audience with God. And the people are terrified of it. But what happens eventually? That glory, that that glowing kind of fades away because it's not his, but it's God's. But for God's people, this endures. This acquittal, this justification, this declaration of not guilty is always valid. And and just because some claim not to believe it doesn't make it any less true. This is my confidence and it's your confidence. And it allows us to have confidence in in bringing it to others because that's one of those things that I think as as human beings maybe causes us to drag our feet sometimes, right? Is, Is to share it with others because sometimes it's that, you know, what if I don't know what to say? What if they ask me a question I can't answer? What if they what if they challenge me on it? But we look to him and his love. We look to him who who is our confidence in each and everything and is our confidence for eternal life. And we recognize it's more important than anything else. Because this, this one righteous act, this one act of obedience, our Savior's life and his death and his resurrection, it's found in his word by which we share the fruit of his salvation. His salvation. 